Hey Emmaus, Micah here. Good morning to you, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Uh, I liked how Jacob said that last weekend. Man, huge thanks to Jacob um, for teaching last week and just walking us through such a rich, rich section uh, of Luke's Gospel and something that we have uh, stories we know so well, texts we've even talked about uh, together before. Uh, but with a fresh, fresh eyes and a fresh approach, and it was just great to just walk through that and just to see this Jesus um, in full color, full living color, not gray, not felt bored, uh, not in some kind of 50s artwork that you may be used to seeing at your grandma's bathroom, staring creepily at you. Uh, but we saw Jesus in living color brought to us by Luke. And the reality of what we saw last week is just another step in this progression of who is this Jesus, of us being amazed with him, of us seeing him for all that he is, who he is, what he is, how he loves, and that's where we've been. Throughout this whole season of walking through Luke's gospel this year, we've, we've talked about this uh, title of A Love Like This, and that title has carried us through. And not because a title is supposed to carry us through, but because that's a theme rolling through Luke's gospel. That we have such a Savior. His name is Jesus. We have a God who came and to our level and interceded and incarnated of our lives and the lives of all those people that we know in our lives, and He lived the perfect life, and he died our death, and he rose to new life. And uh, let me tell you, next week, as we get into chapter 22, that's exactly the story we're going to talk about for a couple weeks. But the reality here is that that's happened. So let me pray for us, and we'll jump right in uh, to Luke's gospel. God, we're grateful for this time. We're grateful for your word. We're grateful that uh, it's constantly speaking through the power of, power of your Holy Spirit. It's not just a book on a shelf. It's not like Moby Dick or the Iliad. It's not like Pride and Prejudice. All great books, but they're books. This right here is living and active, and so that's why we come to it. And not only is it living and active with some kind of mystical force, but the reason is because it shows us who you are, and we come face to face with a living God, a creator God, one who is very near, but one who transcends and is glorious and high and lifted up. And so, God, as we come to your word today, would you do just that? Be high and lifted up. We pray in this moment, and it's in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, jumping in, you know last week where Jacob finished off was at the end of chapter 19 and that was with the, the story of Jesus uh, clearing out or cleansing the temple and so that's right where we pick up in the narrative and chapter 20 verse 1 begins abruptly and it says one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came up and said to him Tell us, by what authority do you do these things? Or who is it that gave you this authority? So for right there, chapter 20, verses 1, verses 2, it becomes kind of an editorial piece that Luke starts to form as he remembers and recasts these stories for, for us here in his gospel. And what he's remembering is what Jesus was doing. And so right where he picks up, he starts talking about this idea of authority, about the, the religious leaders of his day coming and questioning Jesus about well, where did he get this authority or, or, or who gave it to him. And you see... With the cleansing of the temple, with the riding in on the donkey, with, with the lamenting and, the, and the, the weeping that Jesus was doing. And who knows what that looked like and how ruffled the, their feathers got because Jesus was doing this. None of them came and said, why are you doing this? You're wrong. Their question merely was, by what authority do you do these things? You see, first century was maybe a little bit a lot different than our culture today. And one of the things is there was, there was this reverence 
for authority. There was this reverence for the idea of a, a system, especially in the Jewish community, where uh, you had to work your way up and elders were respected. And that was the whole mechanism and, and reality that surrounds the idea of a rabbi or a teacher. And so we know that he was already, Jesus, even as the young man here in his early 30s, that he was respected. Um, and it says that throughout Luke's gospel. But the reality we still begin to see is that he's teaching plainly. But remember, the people who should be getting it aren't. And the people who aren't, aren't, shouldn't be getting it, they are the ones who really understand. Two weeks ago when I was teaching to you about uh, Zacchaeus, that's a great example. Here's a guy who probably shouldn't have been getting it, but he was getting it. And the guys who should have been getting it, who are the, the they, have been, they devoted their lives studying the law and the prophets, and they knew it inside and outside, reciting it, even beyond what it was to be just a Jewish uh, uh of Jewish descent and, and all that that meant by going to uh, J the Jewish schools at this time and just being a, a child of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the law. Like, they had learned that all throughout their whole lives. They were memorizing it. They were summarizing But these guys, they were the upper echelon and they knew it. And so when Jesus comes in cleansing this temple, none of them got upset with like on the outside with why you're doing this, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Their main question was here, chapter 20, by what authority do you do this? Well, this starts off all through chapter 20 and even in the chapter, bleeding into chapter 21, kind of these six different scenarios, little snippets and stories that, that Luke has brought together and editorialized that really just pull out the answers to that question. And now you might say, well, great, walk us through those things, Micah. There, one, the reality is we don't have time. Two, one of the things we see is Jesus answering them with these kind of parabolic, kind of parable-like uh, statements that are, that are super pithy, and he never gives them a straight answer. Now, you might be asking at that, why? Why doesn't Jesus just say, with this authority, or just state it plainly? Well, one of the things we have to see is that if we come to understand who Jesus is and we see him for all that he is, then we understand the authority that he has. This is what it means to have a relationship with him. This is what it means to have a relationship with the God of the universe. You, me, everyone has to understand who is this Christ? Who is Jesus? Who is God? To me, but not just who he is to me, but who is he as he's revealed himself in creation and in his word? How am I seeing him in, his, in my world? And then how am I orienting my life to him? Not the other way around. You see, we could get off on these rabbit trails about objective truth and kind of this apologetic. Um, discussions and, and those are fine for certain scenarios but that's not even where Jesus takes us here but the reality is at the core being a follower of Jesus an apprentice of Jesus having a relationship with Jesus first and foremost looks like surrendering to the authority of Jesus and surrendering to the authority of Jesus is just another way of saying that he's become Lord of our entire lives, that he, my world is now going to operate and orbit around him versus the other way around. And I don't know about you, but that's one of the hardest things for me day to day. That's not something that just we snap a finger, we say a prayer, we do an altar call, or just something happens in some random thing once. It is part of what the Apostle Paul calls the being saved as he uses present tense verbs there all through his letters to talk about being saved. Once saved, there's a moment when the light goes on and we start to see who Jesus is. There's also a process 
We, we talked about that a little bit when we were in Luke 15 in the story of the prodigal sons and that parable there, that we see the younger son coming to his senses slowly before he fully realizes all that he has in this loving father. And I want to say to you that the reality is what he understood there finally once he came to the house was, my father has immense wealth, authority, and the dude knows what he's doing. The dude knows what he's talking about, and that person is loving and cares for me and goes the full distance for me. And that's what's going on right here. As Jesus walks into Jerusalem, as, J as Jacob talked last weekend, that is what Jesus is lamenting. Not only is he lamenting that people aren't getting it and that people aren't being and living how God wanted them to live, but he's, he's lamenting the fact that they, because of that, that shines the light on, that shows him and reveals, if you will, that they haven't understood, one, who God is, and two, who they are and what their identity is as they are made to live in relation to him orbiting around his world. So when we start to talk about Jesus and his authority and his glory, sometimes we can get a bad taste in our mouth because we're only looking horizontally at the relationships around us. But I want us to know, and I want you to know, that as we look into his word in this section right here, that Jesus is saying he's not going to give them plain things. Why? Because he's, he's just revealing. He's revealing. He's revealing. He's hoping they see, they see, they see. Luke is, is writing back to the church saying, look at these people. Let me tell you these stories and these little, these little vignettes that Jesus is, is taught on in the very last days of his life to show and reveal who knew about him and knew who he was and knew why he was here and who didn't. And Luke doesn't tell us which ones that is whether they were Gentiles. Obviously, we see a lot of Jews represented here, but it was everyone. There were so many people that didn't get it. There were so many people who did. And as you know, even the next couple weeks as we finish the story, the Easter story, Judas, Peter, the disciples, Mary, there's so many characters all the way up in the end that don't get it fully. But here we are. We get to look back. We get to see the cross we get to see the resurrection. We get to see him change Peter's life yet again. We see the tragedy of Judas. We get to see the Mary and other women running to the tomb. We get to see him walk into the upper room. We get to see him on the road to Emmaus. We get to see him, the, a love like this. We get to see the full measure. And so as we talk about his authority here, as we talk about his lordship and his glory, know that he's done this and he's gone the full measure and he's done it in context. And so there's this cool operating system as, as Jesus did it and as Luke retells it, where we get to see the high and lifted up glory and it's also meshed with this incarnational presence that Jesus was standing right before them and he was saying to them, I am he. I am. I am. He's saying, I am that same one. I am the one. There's no authority outside of me. So he doesn't even come and droop down to the level of the priests and the scribes. He doesn't even give them an answer really because the authority that he gets is not from any authority but himself because he is the authority. And if he is the authority, we need to be listening. And that demands our respect. And so as we walk through here, that's exactly, they ask him, who gives you this authority? Or what authority do you have? And he just goes in. He starts asking them questions. And so Jesus is asking us questions. So I invite you, go through, read these chapters. If you find yourself, we'll touch on a few of these. But the reality of it is, right here from the get-go, Jesus begins to reveal, and he reveals by asking questions of that old adage, who do you say that I am, that Jesus is so fond of asking? What do you think about me? And that's exactly what he's doing right here. So he turns them the question right there in verse 3 of chapter 20, and he starts talking to them about John the Baptist. Well, the first thing I want you to see of those five ways his, his authority operates is he has an authority that you, we can't question. And that might, again, like I just said, that might ruffle your tail feathers a little bit. Well, good. It ruffles mine. You're not alone. That's how it's supposed to make us feel. 
Jesus doesn't always have to. God doesn't always have to explain himself to us. And because of that, if we question him too much, it becomes this indictment on the level that we know him and we're intimate with him and that we trust him. Man, if I'm thinking about the Psalms, one thing I love most about the Psalms, we're going through that in men's Bible study right now. It's, been a, it's a joy to do that because I love the Psalms. The Psalms give this great picture of what it's like to be just in a human condition. It's to, to be in uh, uh, just skin and bones and to feel things and to lament things and to take joy in things and to be upset about things and to question God. And God is okay with that. But at a certain point, if we start drawing lines in the sand and say, God, you must answer this and you must give me explanation for this before I do X or before I obey your word or before I take a step of faith, we see all throughout his word places where God rebukes those people because his authority is such that we can't question. And that's what he's doing there in verses 1 through 8. Well, the next thing that he does there, uh, moving into verses 9 through 18 of chapter 20, is that he has an authority that we can't refuse. And so as he goes into the the story of the wicked tenants in verses 9 through 18, you might know the story, you might not. That's okay. Go read it. It's awesome. He tells a story about a vineyard owner who sends out workers, uh, sends out his son, and uh, he gets there and ends up they the son gets killed um, by these people who wish to take this uh, vineyard from this guy and make it their own and so Jesus uses that to really almost pull out all the stops as he in, indicts the religious establishment of that day on what they can and what they can't do and how he that what they're scheming and what or maybe they don't even know they're scheming that but the the plan that they that they've colluded on with everything that was going on in our day cannot thwart uh, the plan of God and that even in their rejection of him, of the son, that God will have final say. He quotes Psalm 118 there, the stone that the builders rejected in verse 17 has become the cornerstone and everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and when it falls on anyone it will crush him. Listen, just like these people here, the reality of what's being said is that it cannot be refused. You might say, Micah, I see people refusing him all the time. I have loved ones who have died without knowing him. Let me tell you, right now, wherever those loved ones are, they know who Jesus is. Every person you see around us we, we hear in his word, we, one day their knee, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And that's not just a time-sensitive statement. That is a true statement for all of eternity. And the stark reality is that everyone will come to that reckoning day. We cannot refuse the Lord. And so we can come near, we can have a relationship with him, like we, I was just saying as far as how we choose to orient our lives around his authority, or we can turn away from that, walk away from it, but he'll still be right behind our head. And he's, that doesn't change anything about his, the place of his authority. So what Jesus is saying, actually, they're going to be rejecting me, but in their rejection, they'll actually break themselves. And for some of them, this breaking will be eternal, but for others, that breaking will be for glory and eternal glory. And we know because of the events of chapter 22 and following, we know because of the cross and the resurrection, we know that it was the crushing of the sun, it was the rejecting of the capstone that all also becomes the very beginning of a restored relationship with God and and a true ability to live an eternal life, not just one day, but immediately. 
And that's what Jesus is saying, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You have the opportunity to live eternally in relationship with me, one who is high and lifted up, but one who is so down to earth and intimate and among you. You cannot refuse my absolute authority. Now, a word on authority, because I, I again, I know that it just becomes so harsh and some of that, that, that thinking becomes like this very authoritative figure. And we look at our world today and like, who are the authorities? And it's just this, we're, we're in 2020, we're in a, a, a just a culture and, a, and a, a world that says, question authority, validate authority. And I get that. I'm not saying don't do those things. Of course, earthly authorities, but that's that reality, that interplay that Jesus is doing here in the Gospels is, I've shown you what type of authority I have. And not only have I shown you what type of authority I have, but I'm about to go the last full measure because this is what my authority looks like. My authority looks like serving. My authority looks like giving up heaven and coming to earth and living your life and dying in your place and raising to new life. My authority looks like serving. My authority looks like weeping. My authority looks like loving. My authority looks like washing feet. My authority, my authority, my authority. So the, the very juxtaposition of Jesus' authority met with the story that's being told here by Luke should make us lift our hands in glory and say, if that's what authority looks like, I want anyone who exhibits that to rule and reign over me. And I bow to that person. Now, the only person who can do that perfectly is Jesus. And that's why we can serve him. And that's why we can submit to him. Those are not dirty words. They are good words. They are at the core of who we are as his followers because he gives us value and he calls us friend and he calls us brother and he calls us sister and we rule and reign with him. That's what it means to be in his kingdom. But he still has total authority. So the third one that Jesus moves into here in verses 19 and 26 is that Jesus has an authority that you cannot surpass. And this is the section where you know us so well, they, they try to trap Jesus. They say, so, well, well, tell us this, Jesus. Give me that coin. Should we give this to Caesar? Should we pay taxes to him? Or do we pay taxes over here? Should we, is that what we're supposed to do? We're, if, you're, if you're telling us the truth, then shouldn't we just say, screw you, Caesar? We have a life to live. We're living for a higher kingdom. We're not living for you. You're not the boss of me. My hope is not in Rome. Jesus says, hand me a coin. And he says, who's on there? And he says, oh, it's Caesar. Oh, well, give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to me. <laughs> he doesn't say me yet. He says, give to God what's God's. And that's essentially what he's saying. He's saying, look, Everything is mine. There is no coin that is not ultimately my coin. There is no government that's not my government. There is no president who is not my president. There is no evil despot that wasn't my evil despot. Not that Jesus was saying, that's all good, it'll all be great, and he's going to get to that here in chapter 21, but the reality of it is, he said, here's Caesar and here's God. All of it is operating inside. My father, he's got the whole world in his hands. You know, we sing that old, old time song. That's so true. The whole world. Where does Caesar live? In that world. Where does money exist? In that world. Where does your family li exist? In that world. Where does your strained relationship exist? In that world. Where does the November elections exist? In that world. Where does it all exist? In that world. He's got the whole world in his hands. It's all his. It's, his, it's an authority that no one can surpass. So we are to worship him. Fourth, an authority that you cannot tri trivialize. You just can't trivialize it. They continue all throughout the rest of this chapter 20 to try to get Jesus in some 
kind of riddle or conundrum. Talking about marriage. Talking about, are, are we given to marriage in the next life? Are we not? Who are you be married to? Yada, yada. And, and Jesus just comes at them and says, look, you can't get around this. I am the son of David. And that was huge to them. If David called me Lord, you're supposed to call me Lord. Crazy weird stuff happening there. You'll have to read it yourself. So much richness here. But it's hard to get into, I know. But what I want you to see is we're not going to trick Jesus out of this. We're not going to minimize some points. We're not going to call him on the carpet with this, that, or the other. He's Lord. We can try to trivialize it. We can follow patterns of this world. We can listen to other voices who try to trivialize it, who try to question it. But the reality of it is he is unsurpassable. He is unrefusable. He is unquestionable. And finally, we can't avoid him. You see, his authority is that which we cannot avoid. If he's got that whole world in his hands, if the one standing before Luke's readers was, was the Christ, the one standing before these scribes and Pharisees, before the, these, these Gentiles, before the uh, Pilate and Herod, we're going to get to those next week, if the one who is washing the disciples' feet and telling them and, and observing the Last Supper, if he was Lord, we can't avoid him. You can't avoid him. Everyone in your life can't avoid him. We can close up our ears. We can t- walk away. We can, we can join crazy pursuits of this world. We can try to build up wealth. We can just do anything and everything. But at some point, you will come face to face with, who is this Jesus? And is he the Lord of my life? Is he absolute authority? Absolute. And that's what's going on here in Luke chapter 20. Jesus is absolutely an authority. And you can't avoid him. I can't avoid him. Emmaus Church can't avoid him. Anyone that you know in your life can't avoid him. We will come face to face. And so the question becomes, is he? Is he the absolute authority of your life? Not just a good teacher. Not just someone that you can agree with when it's convenient. Not someone who is just good for you when you're in those foxhole moments of life. But does your every moment reflect His authority over you and for you? Does your every thinking, every moving, does the way you structure your day, does the way that you do all those things, does it say, I have an authority and His name is Jesus and he's gone the full measure for me, and so I know he's my authority, and so what he says is what I say. What's in his word is what I say. And you might be saying to me, well, what does that mean? Well, how do I know that? I, if, I, if he was sitting here face to face with me, I would, I would know that. I would be able to, to see, and I would follow him. But the reality is that's why we have by the power of the Holy Spirit and kept and preserved throughout history the eyewitness testimony of the apostles and the disciples and throughout the ages that we have the scriptures. And so I can't say enough about regular time in the Word because that's how we know Him. I know it gets flat to say, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. Again, we sing that as kids. And many people have been abused in the name of the, it, the Bible says. But I want you to know you have a way to know Him. It's a love letter. And you can know this authority. You can know this one who loves you so much. Because, as I said, His authority looks like this. Don't look around you horizontally. 
and look at Jesus through those filters of, well, what does an authority look like? Well, then I have to put Jesus in that authority. No, you look at Jesus and you get your picture of who an authority is and then look at all others because that's the Lord and Savior that we have. That's the Lord and Savior that Luke is telling us. And then the next two weeks and we get into chapter 22 and 23, we're going to see that Savior. We're going to see him go to the last full measure. We're going to see the content of his love for you and for me and for everyone. And so he's undeniable and he's unavoidable. Well, why do we need to know that? Why tell us that, Luke? <laughs> he's preparing us. He's preparing us for the story that's next. Well, the next story is a crazy story in chapter 21, and it's talking about the foretelling of wars and persecution and the destruction of the temple and these fig trees being unfruitful and getting burned and all of this stuff and the Son of Man and just all this crazy kind of apocalyptic revelations type imagery here. And we can get caught up in those things, but I want us to see that Luke gives us a script. He's saying, look for these things, watch for these things. These things are real. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to allegorize them, but they will happen. And they most certainly did happen with the destruction of the temple, and they most certainly are happening, and they're happening in our day. But Jesus' exhortation to them and the, these onlookers and disciples at this point was not to get weighed down on dissecting and putting a microscope over these words that he was saying as to see like when it's going to come, when can you get out of here, when are, when are you going to be gone. That's not why. But he did want them to be prepared. And he wants you and me to be prepared. And he wants us to know that we're living in these times just like the disciples. We've been in the last days since the beginning. Jesus was inaugurating it. He was inaugurating it with his death, burial, resurrection, that we would be in the last days and that wars would come and persecution would come. And so real quickly, let me just show you eight things that he wants us to be doing, ways that we can be living in light of the end of times and the coming kingdom. And that's not something just to come. That's not a finish line just to get to. But Jesus said, this is what it's going to look like, and this is how you should be. So first of all, he says, one, we need to give our all. He tells the story of the widow's offering, and he's saying, give your all. Don't hold anything back. If you're holding anything back, all is going to be revealed. All, nothing can be avoided. Christ has absolute authority. So be like the, the widow with the offering of the small copper coins. Bring everything to the center of the table and sell it all for the, great, the pearl of greatest price, that, which is Jesus, that he knows you and loves you and wants you and has done it all for you. And he's given you people around you. He's given you the church and he's, he's building something. It's a body that's supposed to, like I said a couple weeks ago, make a holy fascination for himself by the way that we live. So let's bring all our tables, all our stuff rather together and push it to the center table. Give our all. That's how we're supposed to be living. And then two, don't be fooled. He says, verse eight, don't be led astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and the time is at hand. Don't go after them. When you hear of wars, verse 9, and when you hear of tumults, do not be terrified. These things must first take place, but the end will come at once. Don't be fooled. It's not going to come before it comes, is what he's saying. I don't even know the end, Jesus says in other parts of the gospel. Only my Father knows. But when you see me, the one who has full authority, when you see me again, you're going to know it. Don't be fooled. And then he goes on to tell about wars and persecution and how you we will be delivered up and we will be hated but he says this is your opportunity what keep witnessing and that's number three keep witnessing now am i talking about standing on a street corner or handing out gospel tracts well not that only i mean those things have their limitations those things have gotten a bad name but let me tell you are you looking for people to have relationships with where you can have purposeful conversations about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
about the man who has become everything to you, about your maker, God, who loves your soul, who cares about you, who's in total authority? Do you regularly look for people to tell that story to, even if they're in your own family? Because he's saying, look, when you're delivered up, when the persecution comes, when you have to wear a mask, bear witness to the goodness of your God who loves mankind, who protects, who is totally pro-life. And be free. Keep witnessing. Get, look, have endurance. Bear up underneath it and look for opportunities to tell the gospel story, the good news about who your Lord and Savior is, the one who controls all things. Keep witnessing. And four, trust his word. It says in verse 22 of chapter 21, it to fulfill all that is written. All this crazy stuff's going to happen, and we're not going to get down to that, but it has been written. We can trust his word. Jesus is saying, trust what's been written. Not only trust what I'm saying now, but trust what is written. Trust the word. Jesus is talking about the Old Testament. That All of those writings that Israel's held dear, he's saying, read that stuff. All this is coming true. I'm coming true. It's coming true in me. I'm the one who holds the story. Trust the word. Because I'm here, you can trust it. Because I'm here, you know that all of it was true. And it's going to continue to be true. I'm a fulfillment of that, is what Jesus is saying. Trust the word. And it says, fifth, look for my coming. Look for Jesus' coming. Verse 25 through 28, it's talking about, look, you're going to see the man, the Son of Man come in the cloud. Raise your hands, straighten up, because your redemption is drawing near. Our redemption is drawing near. Does that mean we just sit around waiting, waiting, passively, waiting for Jesus to come around in these holy huddles in the, under lock and key? No, we saw, that we'll see Jesus push the disciples out in, in the last couple chapters of this gospel. We'll see all of Acts that Jesus continually breaks up these intimate holy huddles and says go go to the ends of the earth go tell people that's what waiting looks like in the kingdom of god it's an act of waiting it's a waiting with a purpose it's a waiting to tell the story it's a waiting to give all waiting to not be fooled it's a waiting to do and and learn and saturate ourselves in his word and then six recognize the signs he's saying look don't be stupid trees these fig leaves, it's just like leaves. Do you know when winter's coming? Do you, uh, yes, when the, the leaves start to fall off in the fall. Don't put your head in the sand. Don't look at the signs and say, I don't know what's going on. Know you're in the last days is essentially what Jesus is saying. And then watch and pray. We've got to be watchful if we're going to see those. We can't be weighed down with, as it says here in ESV, dissipations and drunkenness and cares this life, verse 34. we got to be alert and watchful. And that watchfulness is supposed to lead to prayerfulness. Asking, seeking, knocking, the authoritative Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father. He wasn't at this time when he's telling this, but we know looking back because he was a man of his word that he did it and he's in heaven and he's listening and he's interceding on your behalf and my behalf and he hears so when we're watchful and we're prayerful he hears and he knows and he knows where you are he knows where i am and he knows our needs and finally number eight keep listening to jesus verse 37 to end chapter 21 says and every day he being jesus was in the temple but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called olivet and early in the morning all the people came to him and the temple to hear him. He kept teaching. Don't know how long this went on, just the rest of this week, if, that's a, if it's a longer period of time, but you see this relationship to continue to come to Jesus. Come to the one who's become everything. Come to the one who holds everything. Come to the one who knows everything about you. Come to the one who knows the end. Come to the one who is not swayed by anything that's happening in our contemporary culture, but go unleashed with freedom into that culture and tell people the good news. Live lives of kingdom living 
lives that have hope, lives who know the ultimate authority, lives that aren't swayed by a Facebook post or what some mayor does or what some earthly leader does. We have a king. He's in authority. Love him. Stay close to him. Honor him. He's glorious. And he loves you. And he loves me. And he's calling us out into those type of relationships just like he was here. Well, I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.